Welcome to the online service for All Saints Church in Wick. If we've not met, my name's Tom, and it's great to be able to welcome you here this morning. Let's begin with a prayer. Lord Jesus, would you meet with us in our homes? Would you show us your love again this morning? As we'll read in the passage today, God so loved the world that you sent your only Son. Heavenly Father, may we know his presence in our hearts, whatever our situation, whatever our circumstances whether we're feeling a little bit discouraged or disconnected, may we know that through him we are adopted into your family. And may he be with us all, we pray this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you are one of the younger members of our congregation, and if your mum or someone who cares for you is there with you this morning, I hope you've done something special for them to show them how much you care. But how about this for a challenge for today? Can you do something to show somebody else as well as your mum just what they mean to you, maybe a card or a gift, could just be a phone call, a text message, or something like that, to say to someone else who might not be expecting it, I really love you and value you and I'm so grateful for the role you have in my life. And that's one of the wonderful things about being part of a church, is that actually we are all adopted into God's family together and everybody is loved. As we begin, I want to pray a prayer, a prayer that draws on some of those uh, women through this Bible story, Ladies involved from the beginning through to its end and the way that God used them and worked through them and can minister to us in our situations. So I invite you to close your eyes, just listen to the words of this prayer and then add your amen at the end. Heavenly Father, Eve was the mother of our humanity. With Adam fallen but by grace promised hope. Lord, teach us that all life is precious in your sight. Sarah, Hannah, and Elizabeth each yearned for a child. Lord, comfort and strengthen all those who long for a child or feel a sense of loss. Hagar was condemned to the harshness of exile. Lord, sustain those who struggle to feed their family. Rachel wept for her children. Lord, pour your love on those who have lost loved ones. Naomi and Ruth were bound together by love. Lord, show us how bitter disappointment can become the sweetness of hope. Mary was the mother of Jesus. Lord, help us share in that promise that by her son we can be loved, chosen and adopted. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's pray together the church's prayer for this week. Merciful Lord, You know our struggle to serve you when sin spoils our lives and overshadows our hearts. Come to our aid and turn us back to you again through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, I hope those of you who are on our church email list have had the news or the information from me about how we want to provide gradually increasing opportunities to gather again safely as we pray and trust things continue to improve whilst acknowledging and realising that we're all going to want to be moving at our own speed. So from Palm Sunday, which is two Sundays time, we're going to use both of our buildings to maximise the space that we have. We need to tweak the service time slightly to make that work and fit with Liminster as well. So from Sunday the 28th of March, We're going to have a nine o'clock service in All Saints. That will be communion service each week, slightly shorter, but with the same talk. And then at 10 o'clock, our service will be back open here in the hall. And that will also be live streamed. So you can continue to watch online, but it will be at 10 o'clock. Or you can register to join us in person if you'd like to, at either nine o'clock in the church or 10 o'clock in the hall from two weeks time, which is Palm Sunday, the 28th of March. All of that is in the news on our website, so go here if you want to read up more about that. But we hope that that will just give us the most space and the best opportunities to gradually be meeting together again for those who are ready to, whilst also acknowledging that some of us won't be yet, and that's absolutely fine. So all of it is there. Do go and have a look. We'd like to see you if you feel you can. We also want you to feel you're still just as much part of the church family if you continue watching online for a while. Obviously, there's still some restrictions in place, but we're trusting and hoping that those will sensibly and gradually also be uh, removed. So do go and have a look. And if you've got any questions about that, as always, 
please just get in touch with me. For now, we're going to turn to God's Word, and I'm really pleased that Hazel is going to read a passage that I'm sure you're very familiar with from John chapter 3. The reading today is taken from John chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light, for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. This is the word of the Lord. Well, hello, my name's Mark. I'm the curator at All Saints Wick. Uh, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get into this amazing uh, story where Jesus reminds us that he so loves the world. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for that amazing truth that you so love us. And God, we pray that it would get into our hearts, that it would grip us, and it would change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amber Van Heck was a 24-year-old student from Texas, and she decided to go on a road trip to the Grand Canyon. And she used her Google Maps as her sat-nav to lead her uh, there. And her sat-nav took her to a, a place where the road seemed to come to an end, but the sat-nav said, you know, it's, it's there, keep going. And so she kept going. Well, eventually, uh, it went to nowhere, and she then ran out of petrol. Then her GPS stopped working, and it was getting dark. She got to a fence, and there was no sign of life anywhere. After five days, she eventually found some phone signal, and she called 911. And an ambulance airlifted her to hospital, where she was treated for exposure, dehydration, and sunburn. And afterwards, she said, I'm just thankful to be alive. I'm sure we would say the same kind of thing. Amber's sat nav, the truth that she was living by, took her into danger, darkness, and so close to death. Let me ask you a question. What is the truth you are living by? And is that truth actually leading you in a direction that takes you deeper into darkness or deeper into danger or even possibly to death? What's the truth that you're living by? And um, We live in a world where there's all kinds of so-called truths that we can grab hold of. Our culture offers us things like consumerism. You know, if you consume enough stuff, buy enough stuff, you'll be happy. You'll be satisfied. You'll have life. And, uh, and yet it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't deliver, does it? Uh, we live in a world that offers us pick and mix religion and spirituality. Take a, a little bit from this religion, a little bit from this way of thinking, a self-help book here, uh, a mindfulness or whatever it might be, and the sum total of that will give you what you're looking for, self-improvement, uh, personal growth, inner peace. But does it really deliver? John, uh, one of Jesus' closest friends, one of his disciples, uh, in his good news story, his account of Jesus, is writing that people might realize who Jesus is, that he's the, the special rescuer of the world, and that as a result will have life as they believe in his name. And the story that we're looking at today is when uh, a man called Nicodemus, who's a religious leader, comes to Jesus at night to find out a little bit more about what Jesus is teaching. And uh, he's full of confusion, and we don't have time to get into the beginning of chapter 3. But in this part that we're looking at now, Jesus tells him three reasons why he came to earth. 
three truths, if you like, to live by that will take you through the dangers of life, out of darkness, and even beyond death and into life. He says there's three truths. The first one I want to look at is this, that that Jesus came that the dying may have life. Look at verse 14 with me. Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Uh, Jesus uh, points back to a story that you can find in Numbers 21 where the people of God had been rescued in an incredible way from slavery out of Egypt and God was taking them to a promised land. But they went via the wilderness and they didn't have the kind of food and water that they wanted and so they started complaining at God and whining at him. And so God sends these serpents out and they bite some of the people and some of the people die and the rest go, God, we're sorry, we shouldn't have complained. You've done so much for us and we're just whining at you even though you've supplied our every need along this journey. Help us. And so God tells Moses, make a bronze serpent and then lift it up and anyone who looks trustingly on that bronze serpent will be healed of the snake bite. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, I will be lifted up, just like Moses lifted up that bronze serpent, I will be lifted up on a cross. And those who look trustingly at me, they will find life. If they believe in me, they will have eternal life. In other words, eternal life is life of abundant joy and immeasurable blessing in the presence of God. And notice that he says, shall not perish but have eternal life. In other words, it's something that we begin to enjoy now in a small measure, even though a significant measure, and that one day we'll enjoy fully when we come into the new creation with him. But you might say, but why would God do this? Well, look at verse 16. For God so loved the world. Do you know that? That God so loves you so cares for you that he would send his most precious possession, his most precious person to die in your place. Uh, The other day, I uh, was having dinner with my family and there was one small piece of really tasty baguette and I thought, do you know what I'll do is I'll put some jam on it. So I went into the kitchen and, uh, and started spreading this jam sandwich and Laura said to me, Mark, what are you doing? Are you putting jam on that baguette? She kind of knows the way I think and she knew that if I went back into the dining room, then Boaz, my son, would immediately want the jam sandwich and would probably insist that I, I give it to him and I would have given it. It to him and so I was eating it secretly in the in the in the kitchen well God's not like me slightly reluctant to give his precious jam sandwich to his son no God loves us so much that he'll give what's most valuable up that we can have eternal life and so him and his son Jesus make this plan to come into the world to rescue us to take us out of death and into life, eternal life, with all the blessings that that brings. Firstly, Jesus says, a truth to live by is that I've come that the dying may live. But secondly, I've come that the guilty may be saved. Look at verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Why did God send Jesus? Why did Jesus come? Well, some people think, well, he came to condemn us. He came, if you like, to come and show us the error of our ways and show us how foolish we were and to condemn us. Um, It's a bit like, imagine for a moment that um, you're in a courtroom cell ready to face prosecution and uh, your barrister comes up to you and says, look, you've not got a leg to stand on. Look at the charges against you and look at the evidence that the prosecution has against you. You, you, Your best thing to do is to plead guilty and plead for mercy or pay the fine. Well, imagine that that happens and then a guard approaches you and says, hey, I'll pay the fine 
just joking, I won't really. Do you know, I can see what you've done. You deserve it. You deserve to be punished for what's happened. Some people think that that's what Jesus is like, that he comes up to and goes, yes, you deserve it. Uh, you, you know, look at what you've done, and that's why I've come, to just rub it in your face, if you like. But that's not why Jesus came. In fact, he's the very opposite. Verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. Imagine for a moment you're back in that courtroom cell, and your older brother comes uh, to your cell whilst your barrister is speaking to you and says, look, no, I'm serious. I'll pay the fine. And he takes out of his pocket a checkbook and signs his name but leaves the rest blank. And he says, I don't know the charges, full charges against you, but I will pay every single penny of the fine that you are given. Now, at that moment, you have a few choices, don't you? I mean, you could just disbelieve your barrister and say, well, he's just probably got something against me and he's not really telling the truth and I ha my life's not that bad. And so I, you know, I, I think I'll be fine. I'll just carry on. I'll ignore my older brother's check. Or you could say, well, I think the barrister's accurate. I know my life isn't, isn't the way that God would want it to be. Um, but, you know, this older brother of mine, does he really have the means to pay the fine that I deserve, that I need to pay. Perhaps he's just a fake and a fraud. Either way, you have a choice to accept the check, thankfully and humbly, or to reject it. And that's the offer that Jesus gives each one of us. You see, the heart of God is that we would accept what Jesus has done so that we're not condemned by the wrong that we've done in our lives, but that we're saved from it through what Jesus has paid for us on the cross and in his, in his resurrection. He wants to save us, not to condemn us. Jesus came that the dying might live and the guilty might be saved. Let me ask you, have you accepted what Jesus has done for you on the cross to give you eternal life, to move you out of condemnation and into a place where you're acquitted, where you no longer have to face the charges that might otherwise be put against you? Have you looked upon the cross trustingly and gone, thank you, Jesus? Well, as I said, Jesus came for three things, that the dying may have life, that the guilty may be saved, and that the fearful, finally, may be freed. Look at verse 19 with me. This is what uh, it says. It says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. John is using this image of, of light coming into the world. Um, light uh, suggests the fact that if Jesus is coming as light, that the world is a dark place, a place that looks away from God and, and wants to be removed from God. And he goes on to say that people love darkness and hate the light. It sounds pretty strong, doesn't it? And you might think, well, why would anyone love the darkness and hate the light? Well, when we realize what our hearts are really like, it's no wonder that we want to stay in darkness because the one thing that light does is exposes what's really there. When we come into God's light, we see what our hearts are really like. And if we're really honest, most of us realize, actually, they're not altogether as good as I'd like to think they are. I, I don't know about you, but a fear of mine is that I'll be exposed for not being quite, quite as wonderful as I'd like to convince you that I am. Uh, a fear that we often carry is that all our failures, all our bad thoughts, all the things that nobody else knows about will somehow be brought to the surface and people will see us as we really are. Or that God will see it. And that's why we don't come to God, because ultimately we'd rather be sometimes trapped in the dark than come into the light and be brutally honest about our flaws and our failures and our sin. And so we choose to fake it instead of have a relationship with God. 
I remember the first time I went to an AA meeting and I was amazed at how people were brutally honest about their addictions. And uh, some time later, I uh, joined uh, a group of, uh, of various different addicts, not just alcoholics, but people with gambling issues, uh, people with pornographic, uh, pornography issues, uh, people that were, had all kinds of addictions. And I sat in the meeting uh, pretty quiet. I didn't want to really say anything particularly. And people would say things like, my name's uh, so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic. Well, after being there two or three times, I'd plucked up the courage to be really honest about an area of my life that I was really ashamed about. And I said, my name's Mark, and I'm a workaholic. And it might sound like such a great addiction because I work so hard, but the truth is that it almost destroyed my marriage because I preferred to work than love my wife. And it almost destroyed me as well. And it was only when I faced up to that part of my life that I could begin to repair things. And I went on to talk about how actually uh, I try to find my identity in work instead of my identity in Jesus. That I thought if I just worked really hard and achieved lots and, and so on and got recognized, then that would give me the, the affirmation and the significance and the value that I longed for. But in reality, I didn't need to work that hard. Because Jesus had already said to me, you're valued, you're significant, you're loved. Well, after that meeting, I can't tell you how liberating it was because I was being honest about the deepest parts of my life. I didn't want other people to know, and yet I was still loved by those people who nodded and gone, yeah, I know, I know what that's like in a, perhaps a slightly different way. How much more liberating is it when we come into God's light and we tell God exactly what is in our hearts? It's not a surprise to him. He knows everything that's there anyway. But when we do that, what we find is not that he rejects us, but that he accepts us, that he loves us. Because he says, finally, you're being honest. And now you can look to me and allow me to deal with that stuff, to take that sin and let me pay for it on the cross. It was one of the most liberating things I've ever done. And when I've been honest with God, it is the most liberating thing too. But you might say, how could I be that honest with God? Isn't he a judge? But remember what Jesus says in this passage. Remember John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God doesn't want us to perish. He knows that's the danger that we face if we carry on going on with life without him, trusting in, our own, in ourselves. He wants us to have eternal life. Remember the other verse that we looked at just now, that God did not send his son in to condemn us, but to save us through Jesus. When we're honest with God, we find that God's arms are open for us. He's not out to get you. He's out to give you eternal life. He's not out to catch you out. He's out to catch you and save you. He's not out to make you afraid. He's out, that he, out to come and grab hold of you and put his arms around you so that you can live now and forever in his loving presence. I asked you earlier, what truth do you live by? Uh, you can live by the so-called truth of consumerism, that if you just buy enough stuff, then you will find value, that you will find life. But we all know that although buying stuff gives us some kind of satisfaction in the short term, it never lasts. It never gives you the verdict you're looking for or longing for of being not guilty. In fact, it just compounds the guilt, doesn't it? Pick and mix religion and spirituality can't defeat death because only Jesus has come as a person, paid the penalty for our sin, and then risen from the grave, defeating death. That if we grab hold of his hand, he'll lead us through life and lead us through death. It can't really offer real love because it's based on just bolstering your own self-esteem. 
But the problem with self-esteem is that often when you struggle with it, your verdict isn't enough. You need someone else to come into your life and say, you're so loved, you're so valuable. And that is exactly what Jesus does. He comes into your life and says, you're so loved, I'd die for you. You're so valuable that I'd give up the most precious thing in the world, myself. I love you and I will lead you out of darkness, out of danger, through death and into eternal life. Look up at me, trust me, and I will take you through it. So let me ask you, what truth are you living by? Perhaps there are truths in your life or so-called truths that turn out to be lives that are actually leading you into danger, into darkness, maybe even towards death. And it's time that you looked at the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. That you looked at the cross and the resurrection. You got rid of that dodgy sat-nav, chucked it out, and instead picked up your Bible and looked at what he says. Look what he says he's done for you. Look what he says about you. Look at what he says his purpose is for you. Take him by the hand and live in his light. He will give you power to do it. He will give you power to live by his truth, in his sight, in his loving presence. Let's pray. Father God, whatever is going on for us right now, would you send your Holy Spirit and open our eyes? And would you redirect our hearts to Jesus? Would you redirect our way in his way? that we would live in the light as he is in the light and enjoy the freedom, enjoy the the saving love, enjoy the guilt-free life, enjoy the fullness of life that you want for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We lift our worship and praise to our loving Heavenly Father. May we exalt your name through our actions and the way we speak. Lord, in your mercy. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, help us not to go our own way, but search your will. We ask that your love and steadfast faithfulness be present in our lives today. Lord, in your mercy. Here as it is in heaven, we pray that we can shine to glorify your name. May we see heaven's peace and love on earth. Give us today our daily bread. Fill us daily through the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask, feed us spiritually. Forgive us our sins. Lord, forgive us, for we fall daily through word and deed and thought. As we forgive those who sin against us, let us forgive those who hurt us. Lead us not into temptation. Lord, let us put on the arm of God daily. Lord, in your mercy. But deliver us from evil. In all circumstances, let us take up the shield of faith, which can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Yours is the kingdom. We pray for our government, for wisdom into the year ahead. We pray and give thanks to our NHS for their dedication in putting others' lives in front of their own. We pray for all clergy, especially Tom, Emily, Martha, Molly and Miriam. We pray for Vanessa, James and Claire. We also pray for Mark, Laura, Grace, Boaz and their child to come. May they know your blessing and find time for rest and refreshment. We pray for all Christians who are persecuted for their faith. May you be their rod and staff. For your glory and honour for ever and ever. Lord, through this coming week, let us shine for you. Let us honour you and let us glorify you. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, do, I hope, continue to reflect on those verses over the course of this week. Lots of us will know John 3.16 off by heart, but what about committing the next few verses to memory as well? And as you do that, actually be praying for people, praying for yourself and praying for others. Praying for this world that we live in. Praying for God's light and life and truth to make a difference. It'd be great to learn not only John 3.16, but the whole section about what God will do for those who turn to him. What great love he has for us. Whoever we are, whatever we're coming from, wherever we've been, however our journey has brought us to this point, he is a God of love. So as we finish, let's pray and give thanks for those who've loved us on this Mothering Sunday, our mums, but also others, praying and remembering those for whom this is a hard day and celebrating all those who put their time in to nurture us, physically, spiritually. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for our mothers and for all those who care for us often in quiet and unrecognised ways. We thank you for all those who love and pray for us and others in patience and love. We're sorry for those times when we fail to care for others and pray that you will teach us to care as you do. Lord, will you hold us all in the light of your presence and guide those who are lost to you. And may the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you now and forevermore. Amen.
Because as we say every week, God is good. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. 